This video is brought to you today by Tacticus, wherein we will explore the infamous Black Shields of the Horus Heresy. They are known for loyalty only to themselves. In the Crucible of Battle, they carve their own path, just as you can define your own, command your armies, and shape the fate of the galaxy in Warhammer 40,000. Tacticus. Tacticus offers a rewarding gameplay cycle of unlocking progression and achievement allowing you to customize your forces and deploy powerful units, each with their own specific traits and strategy. Within this format of game, there remains an element of grind to Tacticus, but for a game I would play for segments of a day, the time balance works for me. As you progress through the campaigns, which can be played as a mirror taking on the enemy role, securing components to ensure your squad strength becomes critical. There are also the arena, PvP, live events, guild raids, and an expanding roster of factions. While Tacticus remains a free-to-play game, paid unlocks are available and often with a regular discount, which I found can be worthwhile if you're wanting those later campaigns or a key faction. Ready to take command and achieve victory? Use the QR code on screen, click the links below, and join Tacticus today. I'm often asked, who are some of your most favoured characters from 40k? And I've listed plenty before, some of them are not even of the Imperium, but if you've never heard of the Astartes, known as Endred Ha, you are greatly missing out. While Ha is undoubtedly typical of many Astartes during the Heresy, who were consumed entirely by their confusion, hatred, guilt, and above all else apoplectic rage, he stands above many others who would choose to scour their legion markings from their armour, save perhaps the occasional Imperial Aquila or other marking of importance to themselves. Very often this extended to also removing all of their colour entirely from their armour. For there is no greater symbol of the darkness that befell humanity during the heresy than the Black Shields. Transhuman warriors driven to the brink of insanity by the battles that slaughtered thousands of their brothers or the actions of their leadership in turning traitor, often with they themselves returning from some mission or small-scale campaign to discover in horror their legion had not only murdered their own, but turned against the Emperor himself. The Black Shields are one of the most tragic and revealing aspects of the heresy, for the Space Marines were so noble and proud before the fall they held each other high, spoke of their traditions, their connections to terror and humanity, they built bonds, saw themselves as the highest form of human development, their powerful father overseeing all, their virtuous mission to crusade and reunite humanity. They were his creations, and just as he stated himself to be still human, they were men also. Except they were not. To any mortal human, and even in the contemporary period of the Imperium, a space marine is a terrifying monstrosity. They are artificially designed, genetically manipulated, augmented, overpowered monsters that are entirely divorced from humanity. Their swollen, overpowered bodies implanted and scarred, their immense battle armour and war gear equips them for war and war alone. The Astartes were always nothing other than a nightmare. Transhuman killing machines who would slaughter any who opposed the Emperor, any who opposed their command, their will, and they themselves could only ever meet their end in battle, for only in death does duty end. When the heresy destroyed their entire outlook, their entire world, there were many who could not accept the truth. Those who continued to hold some belief in what they were either sided to the Emperor or the Dark Gods. But for those who were so mentally destroyed, to have all the illusions of what they ever were stripped away, they were the ones who could finally see the truth, and it consumed and ruined them. The War of the Heresy showed many Astartes the truth of what they were, weapons of the Emperor's design, just as the Thunder Warriors had been, to be used and discarded, tools to kill and to kill very well. 
and with all their noble traditions burned away, with all their resplendent heraldry scoured from their armour, all of what had come before seemed pitiable. These were the Astartes left with nothing, some without a Primarch, others without a world to tie themselves to. They would become instead what their father designed them purely to be, not men, not soldiers, not the masters of mankind. They fell into an all-consuming darkness and would become pure, singular weapons of war, unclouded by their traditions, their structure, their hierarchy, their orders. Their only mission now was to kill, to kill as many of their enemies as possible by any means necessary, no matter the cost, and very often the slaughter that they would unleash was indiscriminate. Without the guiding hand of a legion command structure to control and restrain them, Astartes who were divorced from their legions reverted to this form. Genetically engineered, psycho-indoctrinated warriors with superhuman abilities, their minds and souls tempered for war. After all, this is what they were designed to do. To kill, and kill, and kill, and never question it. The Age of Darkness and Betrayal descended upon the Imperium in M31, and the Emperor's vision of what he wished the Imperium to be would never be the same again. The War Master Horus Lupercal had plunged the Empire of Humanity into the most bloody civil war ever seen, and while the traitors had carefully planned for this moment, they could not control every aspect of how it unfolded. The turning of the traitors is often spoken about in very broad terms. The Sons of Horus, the Death Guard, the World Eaters, they fell, became corrupted by the power and the embrace of the Dark Warp entities. Except that this is, of course, not specifically the case. The heresy was not as binary as one legion turned and another did not. It was far more chaotic and painful. Many Astartes did not turn, but those were slaughtered by the traitors in diabolical traps set for them with no anticipation of what was to come. Many were outright executed, some took a stand knowing they had no hope of survival, but refused to lie down and become the puppets of warp monstrosities. Others fled or went insane or were overcome by grief, rage, and the confusion of the incomprehensible horrors that were unfolding. Those who were consumed by this and still within proximity of the traitors were most likely killed or captured. But others were off on specific missions or just in a different place at the time the main event began to be revealed. They had been absent and may in fact have been for some time, for it was entirely ordinary during the crusade that some Astartes were left behind on specific worlds to aid the transition and compliance, others were tasked with assisting other Imperials, rogue trader fleets, or off on various missions to retrieve and discover Archaeotech, other points of interest. So many of the Astartes among the legions were spread out quite broadly, not on a specific fleet mission all the time. In the early days of the Crusade, it was especially true that the legions operated as cohesive units under their legions' leadership and later the Primarch, later they would become ever more fragmented. Subcommanders were dispatched across the galaxy for various missions, leading to the emergence of independent commands. Ordinarily, these would then return to connect with their legions once that was finished. But a significant number became stranded by, for example, the immense warp storm that was unleashed by the word bearers, the ruin storm, in the heresy. And so this kept many Astartes isolated. But these smaller pockets of Astartes, which could often still number in the thousands, carried almost total authority to wage war and complete their objectives however they saw fit. And when they were unable to reconnect with their legion, they just continued to do so. And these individuals were often also not subjected to the slow, steady, pervasive corruption that poisoned the minds and souls of their brothers within the Legion who were continually around their Primarchs, continually around their Warrior Lodge brothers on the battleships of the Astartes fleets. So when they returned or learned of what had occurred, for those who had been away for some time, they did not recognise their Legion at all. And for those who would come later, the truth of what occurred destroyed them in every way. The engulfing flames of the heresy spread across worlds, star systems, and entire sectors of the galaxy. As the traitors' campaign spread, ever more despicable horrors were reported. Disorder and panic were everywhere. Armies of millions fled or were annihilated, as communications and orders were muddled, absent, or made deliberately false. 
Entire planetary populations abandoned their worlds as the War Master's brutal campaign consumed all in its path. Many of the Loyalist Legions were trapped or isolated and so could put up barely any defensive support to the sectors loyal to Terra, and many fell without seeing any external aid provided to them. There is always significant interest in the beginning and the ending of the heresy. Much is spoken to in terms of those specific legions who turned and those individuals who carried out the critical objectives in what would unfold, or those in the background who would reveal truths essential to the fall or eventual survival of the Imperium. But less is said about what takes place between those two points of inflection, and for the key moments that are, usually again, these relate to very specific core characters and extended Astartes figures of note. But unsurprisingly, few records or accounts exist related to the broader, more miscellaneous victories, defeats and tragedies that befell many thousands of worlds who lay in the path of the traitors, or simply upon those worlds who believed that the Imperium was going to fall and they could exert their will however they saw fit. So the stories of worlds which had little importance other than for those who lived upon them and which were transformed from prosperous new lights in the Empire of the Imperium soon to be twisted into blasted, irradiated, scoured war zones. The battles saw millions dead, the worlds which in desperation saw them draw militias and conscripts from the entire population taking arms to fight untrained with little hope against the horrifically overpowered Astartes who would without mercy or restraint break and maul the human populations. The creations of the Emperor unleashed the horror of transhuman monsters, designed purely for war and domination. These battles remain unrecorded, perhaps because there was no one left to record them, but perhaps also because the Imperium did not wish to remember the pitiable efforts of those souls who were so brutally exterminated by the Emperor's own creations for the destruction upon these worlds was total. The betrayal of Horus cast a terrible shadow across the nascent Imperium of mankind, and for any worlds which lay in the path of darkness, they were soon to be rendered from exhibits that saw the light of progress into blackened wastelands. Front lines could not be held, no response was sufficient to make any stand against the traitors. In rare instances where some form of final stand were made, it was largely thanks to reinforced defences at the heart of a fortress city, geographically unique positions that enabled a defence not to immediately crumble, or it were thanks to those with the willpower, strength and genetic adaptation to do so. This last element being the still loyal, but often mentally broken Astartes of the shattered legions or the remnants of loyalists or traitors. While many planets were wholly consumed by the conflict, there remained many smaller yet equally bitter wars raging, where pockets of isolated sub-commanded Astartes stood strong, yet these also remained largely unrecorded, for they were far too removed from the recognised major battles and path of the War Master to terror, also because many who fought bravely and to the last were simply never to be seen again. Whatever survived of their destroyed ashen remains may have only been discovered decades or centuries later. There were survivors though, who had completed their tasks or encountered outlying traitors or consolidated forces to make a stand and emerged victorious. Some of these Astartes would eventually return to the broader conflict, rejoin their legions, but there were many more who were not, nor could not be, who they were before. The indefensible nature of what had unfolded now twisted them into something else entirely. Those Astartes who emerged from their isolation were often operating what might be described as independent Astartes units. This could be that they took it upon themselves to become divorced entirely from their traitor legion, or sometimes even their loyalist legion. Because the order of all things had now been upended, no one knew who could be trusted, nor their motivations, their agendas, their broad or personal intentions, and these independent groups ranged in size from small kill teams to sub-companies, battalions, or even chapter size. Most notable were that these independent Astartes were regularly known for executing entirely unexpected high-intensity operations. This was likely due to the fact that they had been selected to carry out such operations when they were already separated from their legion, so it was natural that they would continue to excel in this area. These small groups would often launch strategic strikes upon worlds who were entirely unprepared for such a focused, small-scale attack, 
and these may not necessarily be against fellow Astartes. Often they were carried out against high value targets that could tip the balance of a larger approaching assault. A sabotage, say, upon astropathic relay stations to destroy communications or targeted assassinations of key figures with critical power over a system. Whilst the larger Astartes fleets would be detected and seen very easily, these smaller, more anonymous groups could get in and cause damage without their enemy even being aware until it was too late, and the results left defenders in disarray, enabled any oncoming force to sustain an engaging momentum. And while it was not an entirely new concept, in many ways this was the first and most widespread use of the concept of kill teams or these very targeted strike forces that were designed and tasked with infiltrating so as to reach otherwise inaccessible targets, often regardless of whatever the consequences were as well for themselves. Previously during the Crusade, of course Astartes teams may have made small assaults against planetary infrastructure or targets that would aid them generally in their missions. But the way in which these new strikes were carried out often lacked a wider supporting force, and in fact more comparable to Astartes Death Watch kill teams in M41. The vast majority of these operations remain absent from historical documentation. Only critical examples are noted, like for example the assassination of Magister Carpath of Constantinium, who had declared the entire Viridis sector for the War Master in the middle of Year 7 M31. As was commonplace of the absurd claims made by human despots who ruled over their worlds or systems with a ridiculously unearned scale of power and a self-imposed grandeur of authority, Carpath claimed their defences to be as unbreakable as those upon Terra, and that no attacker would ever penetrate them. Soon after, a strike force of loyalists reached the heart of his immense fortified city and executed him as he kneeled below his false throne in front of the entire court of the sector who bore witness to his humiliation. What remains often unaccounted about this instance is that as was often seen during this time, there was the recorded presence of Iron Warriors Astartes standing alongside those of the White Scars and the Dark Angels. Not something to have been unusual perhaps before the heresy, but this event took place long after the Fourth Legion had turned against the Emperor. It's a rare recorded example of Iron Warriors Astartes who remained loyal to the Emperor. In other instances, such as the defence of Nagathar, which saw scattered Astartes, including a contingent of wordbearers, seeking refuge from the warp's turmoil. While Nagathar remained untouched by the storm, the wordbearers aimed to subjugate its populace, prompting Imperial Fists and Dark Angels to intervene and save millions from the horrors that would have been unleashed upon them. And this was common, to see these more isolated, small-scale groups of Astartes all across the galaxy engaging the enemy wherever they were found and not just in the major battles of the documented heresy. Though numerous, these actions are often known only through hearsay or local records, making it challenging for historians to document their full impact, not to mention that these engagements were often of an intensity so severe that few of either side survived, with often each marine fighting to the very last. One other notable figure is Assault Captain Rosius of the Ultramarines, tasked with Pathfinder duties ahead of the ill-fated 933rd Expeditionary Fleet under Rebuti Gilliman's command. A role that would later spare him, though, from the catastrophic events at Kalth. Rosius's assault company was far out from Ultramar and had seized a Sons of Horus strike cruiser at Plutol. Shortly after, this cruiser then ambushed and disabled a Death Guard transport at Terax, later attacking a Traitor Mechanicum fueling station at Spota. But at this point, there are no further records for an entire year of Imperial chronology, and a year within the Heresy timescale is a significant amount of time. But then the cruiser is recorded as re-emerging, leading a fleet at Taurus, 3,000 light years distant, with still Rosius commanding now a multi-legion force of over 3,000. His final engagement was at the Dethoven blockade, an extraordinarily intense battle against traitor forces stranded again by the Ruin Storm, which resulted in few survivors on either side. Now, whilst not necessarily broadly significant in the wider context, this is very typical of the fragmented records that existed during the heresy. Ships, 
Named individuals would punctuate the more significant recorded battles. Groups would disappear, being very small in number, and reappear with significant forces, with little explanation as to how that had occurred. They would often be seen leading different forces of wildly varying scale, mixed forces of different Astartes who would attach themselves to one another as was practical, necessary, or out of pure desperation. While obvious that the heresy saw such situations and events, it's just important to re-score how chaotic, unpredictable, and often entirely random the movements, engagements, and direction of the Astartes legions were in the heresy. Because it ran entirely contrary to everything they had seen so far, and was often entirely disturbing, alienating, and unsettling for them to have to work with different legions, those they did not know that they did not trust, and even those whose legions were traitors, whilst they themselves would say they were loyal. For some, this whole disruption would prove altogether too much. The concept of belonging to a legion at all just collapsed mentally for them. They saw no longer any purpose to remaining true to their original legion. What was the point of this when brother turned against brother, loyalist legions mixed with traitors who fought against their own? Nothing made sense anymore. For some, this just left them broken, shattered, and for others, they were consumed by this rage and suffocating desire to deliver upon their brothers, their brethren from the Legion, and even their Primarch, vengeance. In the annals of the Age of Darkness, mysteries are shrouded by the veil of history. It is described as the Age of Darkness with good reason, for now only fragments of the diligent scribes exist, for those of the historiography to piece together. The most extreme example of those independent or shattered Astartes forces acting as entirely irregular units were known as the Black Shields. Where this term originated is unknown. It's even unrecorded as to whether these individuals who chose such a path described themselves as such. For these were Astartes who had entirely denounced their legion. They were anonymous as was the banner they fought under. But this was a banner which bore no colour or badge at all. This was very likely by design, to confuse and conceal their allegiance or origins, perhaps as a tactical ploy, more likely out of a deep sense of humiliation. Where some have compared the Black Shields to the Shattered Legions, the two in actuality occupied different points upon a spectrum of irregular Legionis Astartes forces. The core difference was that where many of the Shattered remained true to their legion, in most Black Shield bands, it was likely that even among individual squads, they were composed of warriors born to different legions, and the identity of which in many cases continued to remain unknown, even to their brothers. Few would ask such a question, and even fewer would be prepared to give the answer. Black Shields engaged in battle against both sides of the Horus Heresy. When they first began to appear, again, unspecified, but what records do remain have been traced to as early as the war for the Coronid Deeps. This is a highly industrialised, very strategically valuable region of space which contains masses of imperial worlds, like for example Port Moor. A number of legionnaires were seen to emerge in battle here, clad in black painted battle plate, bearing no iconography other than the Terran Aquila and were reported as fighting for the Loyalist cause, but they maintained a distance and stayed entirely separate from the Loyalist chain of command, acting entirely on their own cognizance. They ignored all communication, any specific accounts of their actions do not exist, or were destroyed, swallowed in the anarchy that was the Imperium's fighting withdrawal from the Corona Deeps. In the shallow depths of Eurosa's twinned gas giants, a harrowing saga unfolded. Ashen-skinned warriors with eyes as black as the void carried the mark of the War Master upon their otherwise unadorned Mark VI armour. They were seen to unleash devastation upon unsuspecting colonists, sending their vast macro bastions hurtling through the molten crust, ensuring the fiery demise of millions. Many different types of Black Shield existed. Most were defined by their personal origins and the circumstances of their formation. Some were driven beyond their transhuman limits due to how severely consumed by grief or insanity they were, 
at the War Master's betrayal. This caused many Black Shields to be truly terrifying to face in battle, even for other Space Marines. They acted with levels of emotion, ferocity and power believed impossible for an Astartes. Many were in fact so broken in mind and spirit, they no longer recognised or acknowledged the mastery of any lord or authority. They waged war upon any and all they encountered, and existed in a state of broken mental fog, as if nothing mattered, and maybe that it never had. Having spent their entire lives dictated by order, rules, honour, such concepts had disintegrated before their eyes, and now they were determined to claim their own destiny, even as the Imperium tore itself apart. All they could cling to now was to remain in control of their own decisions. It was common for Black Shields to renounce whatever their original legions were, and none considered themselves as belonging or beholden in any way to their Primarch or their Astartes brothers. Sometimes this was to enable loyalists marred with the misfortune of belonging to a traitor legion, an opportunity to repent in the eyes of the Emperor. For those broken from their traitor legions, or of course there were also those individuals among the loyalists who turned. There may be others who simply felt that they had failed in some way or allowed the heresy to take place, and for them this deep shame was to conceal their armour. This is actually an important factor to remember though in the contemporary history of the Imperium. The way the heresy is often described is ordinarily quite binary, and this is likely deliberate to minimise what was already an abhorrent section for Imperial history. But despite how it is often told or described as there being simply two sides, traitor legions and the loyalists, the reality was far more chaotic. While it may be true to say that the bulk of the legions either turned traitor or remained loyal, they all had groups who splintered to the other side. There is famously a Raven Guard who joined the Night Lords of all things, and even ascended their hierarchy, and the less said about the Dark Angels, the better. But many legions were missing contingent elements, or who simply went missing during the heresy. The truth is always far more grey than history would want us to believe, and for the Astartes during the heresy, this was no exception. So whether it was for more personal reasons, or deliberately to mislead for strategic purposes, any who would separate themselves from official legions commonly obscured their colour in some way. Some repainted their armour black, others just scoured it to the bare metal and ceramite. But important to distinguish that these were not the knights errant, who of course famously wore no designation other than the bare grey ceramite and the mark of the sigillite. At least one group scorched their armour in a fire rite of some forgotten feral world, renouncing their heritage, leaving their armour a purest black. While many chose to remain unmarked and anonymous, others did adopt new heraldry of their own invention. Sometimes this was individual or designed and dictated by a strong-willed leader who would create their own vision for their warband. Some are even known to have applied camouflage patterns to their armour, a practice only rarely observed among the legions. Most Astartes wore their bright colours proudly, the concept being that they had nothing to fear not their enemy nor death itself. If anything, the colours of an Astartes armour were to be an intimidating factor to the enemy, allowing themselves to be seen, so that their enemy would understand that they knew no fear. Which was all very well when you were deploying forces in the thousands or the tens of thousands, but in groups that only numbered a few hundred, and who were facing their brethren of comparable armour and weaponry, and often better supplied, suddenly then, camouflage begins to become a reasonable consideration. Although, it is worth saying, given the strength of Astarte's visual and sensory systems, suddenly the armour aesthetics seem a trivial consideration. Although, it is worth noting, they were not always engaging or infiltrating against their fellow Astartes. At least one group was observed to wear composite battle plate, with each part scavenged from other legions, mixed together with no rhyme or reason. A sea green vambrace taken from a slain legionary of the sons of Horus, worn next to a bone white gorget torn from the corpse of a defeated world eater, for example. And this again is a largely forgotten or uncommonly noted reality that as the years of the heresy progressed, ever more of these blackened or strange unknown Astartes forces, some bearing previously unseen colours or strange armour configurations, were recorded fighting across the entire galaxy. In one instance, a haunting spectacle transpired. Warriors adorned in discordant heraldry, their armour stitched from remnants of fallen foes, the ragged warriors plundered the stasis arsenals of an imperial sanctum. These then same stolen dimensional weapons would be unleashed upon the Sons of Horus at Antana Minor, the result cataclysmic horror. 
consuming loyalists and traitor alike. Their armies consumed by the bizarre ancient weapon, which continued to tear an entire planetary continent asunder. And this was another part, again, of the heresy which is not always entirely documented, that the strange, bizarre relics from the Dark Age of Technology would be unleashed with horrifying consequences for the Astartes and human worlds alike. These shadowed warriors were only observed in fragmented pic captures, the low quality images difficult to assess, but in a few still frames those who were there were seen without their helms, they were seen to be adorned with identical Scythonian gang tattoos across their scalp, suggestive that these were in fact the sons of Horus who had remained loyal and unleashed a hellish vengeance upon their own legion, but also indiscriminately the loyalists and those of the planet as well. This was one of the details that made Black Shields a very difficult force to contend with during the heresy, most often because it was very hard to easily define who they were even aligned with. They were encountered on both sides of the war, commonly they ignored all official communications, in many cases they were seemingly not fighting even for one side or the other particularly, other than just themselves. And while some still carried the mark of terror, this was by no means any definitive identification, just as others wore the eye of the war master. These may have been loyalist, traitor, or just neither. Groups of black shields were often even seen working toward the same goals whilst wearing both markings for terror and the war master. None were part of any coherent chain of command either, and while they were seen occasionally to align with the strategic aims of one side or another, they also engaged in actions that may have easily undermined a broader strategic goal that they could have no knowledge of. The Black Shields never followed nor sought orders from outside forces, they did not contribute intelligence or coordinate battle plans. This extreme difficulty in both communicating with and having these groups comply with Imperial Edicts meant that as the heresy progressed and especially in its aftermath, it was often the default conclusion of the Terran Council that these groups be designated as little more than murderous pirates and renegades, concerned only with claiming their own goals. In many cases, this may in fact have been true, but more often, they were simply so damaged by the impossibility of what had taken place that they were riven of all reason. And while they may have operated on some level of fighting toward a cause, it was certainly true that Black Shields were both unpredictable and almost impossible to cooperate with. So while those among the Shattered Legions attempted to knit themselves back together into something of a coherent force, the Black Shields by comparison were a random mess of completely individual directions, some ruled over with an almost Xenos-like preference for the strongest member leading by default. Most groups disregarded entirely any concept of rank or chain of command, they disregarded and abandoned much of the formerly necessary roles that existed like equerries and praetors. It's fair to say they were in many ways one of the significant elements of collateral damage that occurred within the offences seen during the heresy. For while some may have been attempting to repair the damage the traitors had caused, others were absolutely only concerned with carving their own petty empires, enslaving any and all who were too weak to oppose them, believing loyal order to be no longer relevant, and for many it was as good as having turned traitor. It would certainly be true that as time progressed, some would slip further into the grip of the Dark Gods, but who maybe had been unable to fully admit to themselves that this was the path they had chosen. In terms of numbers, it was determined that Black Shield groups rarely numbered more than a thousand or so warriors. In some instances, they were seen at maybe a few thousand, but several hundred was most common, or even down to as few as a single squad. The Black Shields were some of the first Astartes to wield mixed war gear. Unlike how the larger Legion forces had fought, squads were now seen to carry a more versatile selection of equipment, likely as there was no one around to tell them otherwise, and they could indulge in personal preference. Such squads became known to other Astartes as Marauders. In terms of assets, they were often severely limited though. Most had access to some form of a warship for space travel, either a Legion vessel or a lesser void craft captured during the course of or subsequent to their formation. Astartes escort vessels and strike cruisers provided a combination of assault vessel and base of operation. Being both large enough to transport the group, plus whatever vehicles and landing craft they had managed to preserve or acquire. Most Black Shield forces were certainly powerful enough to support assaults against medium defence or outlying worlds. 
and most crews aboard starships, as is even true in the contemporary Imperium, are usually bonded to their masters, and the shipmasters bonded to their Astartes. So it was not unusual that the human crews remained loyal to the actions of their superiors. And in the example of many Legion serfs whose loyalties were simply transferred to their new lords. But many others had willingly just thrown in their lot with the outcasts, or been forced to do so by cruel circumstance. Which was again true also of the traitors in the heresy, many who served may not have agreed, but were forced to go along with them. Of course, any who had any real courage and loyalty to the Emperor would choose death. One defining aspect of Black Shields is that they were often seen to be led by an individual who possessed a truly fierce presence and internal strength to have weathered the horrors seen unleashed by the traitors, but who now sought to drive their own destiny, and inevitably individuals with such an aura would sweep others along with them in their quest. Their strength remained mostly invested in infantry elements. This was largely out of necessity, due to the fact that they were completely isolated from logistical support, and so any materials required for heavy support would be burned through quickly. This was very problematic, and it significantly limited the types of operations that Black Shields could engage upon, despite some fielding a decent number of Astartes. Drop pods, for example, were difficult to secure and recover, and so were not commonly seen used they were more likely to use storm eagles and fire raptors to deploy to the surface of a world. Unlike other Astartes, they were seen to regularly strip enemy equipment and materials to resupply themselves, so while it was not entirely unseen for them to deploy machinery such as tanks, dreadnoughts and the like, these would only have been used on critical missions and only where they knew they could recover or resupply were that mission successful. And of course, smaller groups of Black Shields have considerably less resources and were lucky to have any vehicle support at all. Entirely unsurprisingly, many were bitterly resentful of the fate that had befallen the galaxy. Others, though, enthusiastically embraced this new existence and relished the chance to prey upon those weaker than themselves and to take by force that which they considered their right. And this reflected a common trait seen among Astartes toward the later period of the Crusade, where some understood that they existed to serve and protect humanity, others believed humans to be inferior, and that they were the ultimate human form. That the Space Marines themselves should lead humanity. Which was of course something the Emperor was well aware of, and why he had noted himself that they were designed for war, but not for what was to follow after. Again, never explicitly stating, but always my belief that the Emperor fully intended to kill off at least a significant number of the Astartes, as he had with the Thunder Warriors, and that potentially the heresy had been intended all along, but that it simply unfolded not how he entirely specified and wanted, or that was just sooner than was convenient. Within the Black Shields, there were identified several distinct groups or classifications, beyond the already noted core alignments of traitor, loyalist, or those who were just indiscriminately unaligned, there were the renegade, the disavowed, and the damned. The most difficult to identify in terms of number were those who remained loyal, but were of the traitor legions. There are no figures to point to how many of these became Black Shields, and the traitors were both merciless and efficient at knowing their own sons and purging them in disgustingly immoral traps where they could be culled. While the most known events like Istvan III and the Wordbearer's early purgings are commonly referenced, it's inevitable that other traitors did so as well. The numbers disposed of can never be known, but none of these attempts by the traitors appear to have been complete for there were still considerable numbers who had been on longer term assignment and when they learned of the betrayal were truly horrified. Many turned to swift campaigns of violence against their legion or unleashed campaigns of bloody vengeance upon legion worlds and assets. Some disappeared, others, as was common during the heresy, decided they would sell their lives at the highest possible price to the bitter expense of their own legion, considering themselves effectively already dead. Those who considered themselves among the disavowed were those who had learned of the warrior lodges of the traitors, for Astartes' legions often crossed paths and bonded in kinship, despite the significant difference in the legions. And it's even stated that the concept of warrior lodges continued along with some of the Black Shields, and were accompanied by small groups of Davonite Lodge priests. How many of these groups were loyalists turned renegade is entirely undocumented, or at least believed to be, and few would go looking for such answers now. The last main group were those who for whatever reason chose to separate themselves from their legion, 
the Emperor had long pushed aggressively the development and production of new Astartes, often forcing their production beyond the recommended limits of their gene seed, and this was seen especially by the time of the heresy to have begun to produce often minor but sometimes severe defects in the Astartes. The instability in the purity of gene seed and its exposure to certain influences or even deliberate tampering with the genetic template had caused all manner of aberrations. And at first, such warriors might appear blessed with superior strength, speed or resilience, but invariably they proved unstable in other ways. Some were prone to physical or mental collapse in the heat of battle, spontaneous and uncontrolled mutations under stress, their limbs distending into horrific form as bones re-knit and muscles distorted, battle plates split apart in the process. Some may have been indistinguishable in appearance from any other legionary, yet they simply possessed such an unnatural aura that others could not stand their presence, and with prolonged exposure would be driven by an inexplicable urge to just strike them down. These damned individuals may have been classified as black shields, but may not have been outcasts from the legions. It's speculated that some may have been deliberately created also in secret within any or one of the legions, then released as living weapons of mass destruction, created entirely ignorant of their heritage, rampaging through the galaxy in pursuit of some implanted imperative, burning fiercely through the despair that was prevalent in the Age of Darkness. The Black Shields, known as Death Seekers, were motivated by an all-consuming drive to offer their own lives upon the altars of war, not dissimilarly to Sororitas Repentia. These Astartes had become mentally unstable, either as a result of what they had witnessed or endured through brutally enforced and accelerated psychoindoctrination at the behest of the Emperor, and since the outbreak of the heresy, death has become the entire center of their being, either as a blessed release, sought for atonement, or programmed obsession. But they would not meet death vainly, nor will they give their lives easily, taking as many of the foe down with them as they can. The seekers of death would stare it firmly in the eyes, and through sheer force of will or other malign influence, they're able to shrug off otherwise debilitating injuries as they abandon themselves to the chaos of battle. And this is a category that Endred Ha would very much fit within. There are also those Astartes who, having seen betrayal, atrocity, and unthinkable carnage at the behest of distant and uncaring masters, have become significantly hardened veterans, which considering how hardened Astartes already are, is saying something. These individuals will have survived against all odds, and now trust only in those next to them in the line of battle. Not their superiors, not their commanders, no overarching plans of a legion. These brothers will fight and die and strive to see another dawn, but not for some great cause or their primarch. The lies, the whispers of lords and potentates alike, for them they have nothing but scorn. Many others were just psychologically purged and contaminated by witnessing the depths to which both sides in mankind's civil war would sink to in order to destroy the other. Having seen atrocity after atrocity, planets rad and chem purged, thousands of screaming civilians consumed by white chemical fire and the merciless blades of traitor and loyalist alike, these Astartes concluded to take their own path and washed their hands of both sides, choosing now to pursue their own goal, and this may often mean the path of the Marauder and Corsair to determine their fate. One of the most miserable iterations of Black Shields were those known as the Chimera, during this darkest time for humanity, there came into being Astartes who simply should not have existed. Some were the result of failed rapid gene seed implantation or extreme psychoindoctrination programs, others were the product of prohibited mixed gene seed experimentation or other influences of unnatural force. Most commonly, these creations were an attempt to design their way out of the war and win a genetic breakthrough that could gain a decisive edge, a goal which for some meant all guardrails no longer existent. All who attempted this soon learned the folly of their error. The product of such experimentation were at best unstable or unpredictable, while others succumbed to irreparable madness or debilitating cancerous mutations. Others saw them gifted with aberrations terrifying to behold, but they were ultimately fatal. As with so much of the heresy era, little outside the core events went recorded, and of the accounts that were committed to record, many were misrepresented or destroyed in the flames of war consuming the entire Imperium. Of the Black Shields, there exists even less documentation, and where they are recorded, the majority are incomplete accounts of brief actions or a rare few that can be attributed to historically defining encounters. 
most though are fogged by historical obscurity. But this does not erase the fact that the ferocity unleashed by the Black Shields left an indelible mark upon the heresy war, shaping it at a local and wider strategic level. While it can be difficult to connect many of these individual contributions to the broader picture of the Horus Heresy, many who have studied the actions of the Black Shields believe that cumulatively and despite their uncoordinated efforts, the independent cells of Astartes, so broken by the nightmare of what had unfolded, actually achieved a very significant contribution to the ultimate conclusion of the heresy. For no matter how small their actions may have seen when placed against the greater battles, they all furthered the heresy's ultimate resolution. And this is no better illustrated than the contribution made by Andred Ha. Nonetheless, despite some positives being anecdotally accounted for, the appearance of the many and varied Black Shield groups continued to create a significant problem for those tasked with documenting such mysteries, among the innumerable others that surfaced and were revealed during the heresy. What remained even more troubling though after the heresy had officially come to a close and entered into the period known as the Scouring was the status of so many Astartes who had originated as part of a traitor legion yet remained loyalist. What to do with them? Many would be killed. The judgement of these Black Shields had to be addressed. Those who had continued to exist as independent or renegade splinter factions, and some of whom considered themselves aligned still with terror, but who acted in a manner that was far outside the boundaries of acceptable conduct for loyalists. In many instances, they would still even unleash weaponry that had as much or even more of a catastrophic impact upon loyalists as it had the traitors. How were such groups to be secured, or indeed any culpability assigned? The matter remained for the longest time largely unresolved, but ultimately many fled either into the Eye of Terror, the Edge of the Void, or were just destroyed. Endrid Ha was an immense bulk of Astartes, known as the Riven Hound. He epitomised unyielding loyalty and unwavering resolve as a former Praetor of the World Eater's Legion of Space Marines. He is in many ways an incredibly simple character in the grand scheme of 40k, but for me he is an amazing character purely due to, as I've noted, the purity and sense of focus, purpose, of what the Black Shields were. He hailed from the inaugural cohort of initiates cultivated on the hallowed grounds of Terra itself. His origins predate the very nomenclature shift that would later christen the 12th Legion as the formidable Warhounds. Indrid's journey commenced before the fateful rediscovery of their Primarch Angron upon the Crucible of Nasiria. But when Ha would finally be confronted with the harrowing descent of his legion into treachery under the banner of the Warmaster during the nascent stages of the heresy, he chose to forsake his brethren, initially marshalling a formidable force of Astartes in the ongoing struggle against the traitors. But it would be amidst the aftermath of the incursion upon Duat that Ha forged the irrevocable alliance with the stalwart forces of the Loyalists. This crystallised in the form of an unbridled, all-consuming rage, not entirely surprising as an Astartes of the World Eaters. For with his warband, he would traverse the stars, engaging the forces of treachery with unrelenting fury and resolute determination, etching a saga of renewed valour during the Age of Darkness. But with all that said, Ha was still known for being an entirely brutal commander. He even killed those who questioned his orders, and his singular focus was to kill the Warmaster or die trying. Endred Ha was part of a trio of three battle brothers within the first company of initiates the 12th Legion raised from the Imperial Geneworks upon Terra, and this was long before his brethren had even taken the name of the Warhounds and would see the rise of Angron's Eaters of Worlds. He would become the sole survivor of that era, a bygone relic, possessing a controlled ferocity that was observably distinct from his legion's later iterations. Perhaps because of his early origins upon Terra and the developmental gene labs, Ha was unusually massive for a space marine, but still possessed a swiftness that defied his stature. And this even prompted speculation among notable apothecaries like Fabius Bile as to the source of his unique genesis. It was surmised that Ha's early implantation imbued him with traits divergent from the standardised Astardi's process, rendering him a singular entity amongst his brethren. 
something that during the heresy, these kind of benefits were often experimented to try and replicate as we said earlier, and that those such as Bile would later continue to attempt to replicate in their own works. In one of his early notable feats, Har would emerge victorious in single combat against the Thunder Warrior during the Cerberus insurrection, displaying his typical prowess that would astound his peers. And a defining aspect of Har was that unlike many of his kin, he in fact rejected the Butcher's Nails upon the Legion's reunion with their Primarch. Because Har's savagery stemmed not from cybernetic augmentation, but from an intrinsic wellspring of primal fury. His resilience amidst adversity seemed almost unnatural, as was his ability to survive wounds that would have killed lesser individuals. He would depart from the Legion after the events upon Nuceria, with Har embarking upon a clandestine crusade orchestrated by Malkador the Sigilite, thus shielding him from the devastating events that would unfold in his absence, with Malkador even seen to observe so few of your kind truly understand. Warriors make for adequate butchers, but poor killers. But you are a killer, Endred Har, a killer among killers. And this is something that would become true very much of many Black Shields. So upon learning of his legion's treachery at Isvan III, Har disavowed his allegiance, ultimately finding himself then incarcerated, as were many, within the confines of an imperial prison. Driven thus to the brink of madness by the revelation of his legion's betrayal, Har embraced the mantle of a black shield, relinquishing all ties to his former legion and swearing an irrevocable death oath to atone for their sins. When he escaped, he would gather together the remnants of disparate legions to form the Fangs of the Emperor, a black shield unit comprising survivors from the Death Guard, Iron Warriors and Raven Guard, Together, they would wage a relentless crusade against the traitors and would seek retribution for the crimes of them carried out in their legion's names. After a failed attempt to secure weapons that could have been used against the traitors, namely three Ordinatus Ullator terrifying machines of war rarely deployed by the Mechanicum, Har and his group were forced to retreat and withdraw. And this was typical also of Black Shield units. Their numbers and their capabilities were limited, and they were not always successful in the ambition of their engagements. So this conflict on Xana II had drained the resources of the Rivenhound. Now desperate for supplies, weapons and reinforcements, Har set his sights on Duat, a recruitment world for the 12th Legion. And the World Eaters had established a stronghold here, consisting of three dark water nodes. Primus for recruitment, Secundus as an armory and Tertius for refueling and maintenance. And here he would discover one Praetor Apothecary Calibos. He'd been left upon these worlds, and Calibos thought that if he could give his legion enough new warriors, then Angron may bring him back amongst the ranks of the legion. But instead he is left to rot here, surrounded by feral humans, barely able to speak Low Gothic. But the presence of Calibos, the apothecary, was fortunate for Har, as he was not only a brother of the Twelfth, but also the closest you could approximate as having been a friend to Har, a rarity for someone of his life so far and personal disposition. The confrontation that followed was one of many thousands of similar tragedies that were untold throughout the Age of Darkness. But upon seeing the twisted creations Calibos had been creating, stronger but unstable, more twisted, they were far from anything one would call Astartes. Har could see that Calibos had seemingly lost all sense of reality and was appalled by the creatures that his friend had created. The Riven Hound had held out a slim hope of being able to turn his friend to his side, but it was entirely clear that the Apothecary was not only lost, but hell-bent on rejoining his legion. Har was forced to kill his friend, an action that was perhaps the final breaking point of whatever humanity Har had been able still to retain to this point. In the aftermath, and with resources secured, Har left the system to move on and play a role in further conflicts. The fate of Calibos had only more deeply scarred and shown Har what he truly was, a weapon that needed to bite and rend and tear and devour its enemies. They laid course to aid Rogal Dawn's great effort at the Battle of Beta Garmin. The story is yet untold, but that we may soon know in more detail. What is recorded within Imperial history is that Har would meet his legendary end fighting below the Saturnine Gate during the Siege of Terror. 
The kill teams had been hunting down and slaughtering traitors, having abandoned now any sense of glory or overwhelming victory. The Siege of Terror was progressing to a truly destructive scale, and a path to achieving victory over the traitors was appearing ever more elusive. It had devolved now into a war that was simply about shedding blood. They fought for survival or the savagery of mutually assured destruction. In the depths of the Saturnine Gate, there was little ranged combat. There were little tactics or refined strategy. It was about raw brutality and slaughter. It was about taking another's head and slamming it into the stone walls of the palace again and again until they were dead, and then smashing it a few more times for good measure. And this was a level of combat and intensity that Ha reveled in more than many others. Straight butchery of traitors was all he lived for now. So when the opportunity to get his fists red with the blood of the Mournival was reported, it was a chance he would not be denied. The Sons of Horus had attempted an underground infiltration, for they had believed this to be an oversight, a less well defended route than the massive battle occurring on the exterior. As they were soon to discover, they would be badly mistaken. The fighting down here was close quarters, physically claustrophobic and with little ranged opportunity. When bolters did roar into action, it was at point blank range, instantly followed by fist and blade, smashing enemies' helm and skulls into pulp, beam weaponry tore through enemy, often two or more bodies at a time. Flame and plasma consumed traitors who died trapped within their armour like charred dead statues. Others torn apart by weapons of explosive force, leaving little more than their shredded remains. These kill teams below Saturnine were no ordinary Astartes though. They had the likes of Garrow, Sigismund and Har among them who with his unquenchable rage and power fist would tear through the traitors, crumpling Terminator armour as if it were metal foil. But then they were to face not just traitors, not just sons of Horus, but a member of the Mournival, the first captain at that, Abaddon. Unlike some of his warriors who were comparable or lesser than these legendary loyalist figures, Abaddon was both fast and efficient for the size and resilience of his bulk, and he had taken it as red that he would be able to just cut through these pitiful marines with his first company terminators, who had never failed, never been beaten in battle, because after all, he was the first captain of the finest company of the finest legion. Yet doubts were beginning to enter his mind, as this rabble of Astartes were proving difficult to kill. And then, the unthinkable happened. One of his Justarian terminators was decapitated. The effect for Abaddon was deeply psychological. Hart and the others were taking losses, but they were doing something that Abaddon had not anticipated, never seen before. His Justarian were being killed. Not single individuals who made foolish errors or were overwhelmed. They were being killed by the dozen. They were being cut down. And it was then that Abaddon realised they were cornered. They were being butchered. And soon the Loyalists would receive further reinforcement. They had to get out, and get out now. All of his plans for entering the palace and wreaking havoc evaporated. They could not prevail against these Astartes, who fought with a barbarity that his warriors were not used to. The Sons of Horus were not rage-consumed primitives like the White Scars and the World Eaters. They did not subscribe to the mantra of the Imperial Fists either, with their no-backward-step nonsense. It was time to retreat. He voxed to his surviving men to retreat and activate their homing beacons for teleport, and then he realised he was going to die. The extraction was ordered, but their signals appeared blocked. This was when Abaddon reached the same mentality as so many black shields, a mental purity of purpose. He knew he was going to die, and so suddenly knowing this, he would sell himself at a high price. For how many of these challenges could he kill? The Swordmaster Garrow? The brutish savagery of Har? It was also the moment when Abaddon realised something that he would carry all the way through to M41. As he said it himself, all of them, Magnus, Lorgar, Fulgrim, fools. Horus was a fool. The warp was nothing. Being a warrior was everything. It defined him. The skill of combat, the lessons of defeat, the joy of triumph. That was his sacrament. Let them worship their false gods and giggling abominations. This was what he had wanted. The chance to fight like a man, not a demon. This was a moment of interest because it highlighted just how divided the traitors were. While there were those who walked willingly into the arms of chaos, 
others, like Abaddon, did not wish to accept the twisted horror of the reality they had committed themselves to. Just like the Black Shields, Abaddon now fought against the Loyalists with no principle in mind other than to find out simply who was the best. No sides, no good or bad. Imperial Fists, Black Shields, Terminators, Tactical Marines. There was no greater purpose than to fight within this killing chamber. Just war and only war. As Nathaniel Garrow cleanly cut through a Justair and Terminator, Abaddon and the former Death Guard would finally duel blade to blade. He dealt Abaddon two wounds that would have killed anyone lesser, but through an error of judgement Abaddon slammed him against the stone wall, cracking his chest plate with an irresistible punch, and Garrow would have died there were it not for Balsepitus, a beautiful display of swords and martial skill, unrivalled anywhere but here and now in this confined kill zone. Abaddon felt sorry when his blade cut the Blood Angel in half. But then came the Riven Hound. Ha slammed Abaddon into the wall with the restrained ferocity of a beast. The force so great it shattered the stone bricks and Abaddon felt his bones break, even his organs rupture. Ha had little skill to worry about, but he had plenty of fury as befitted one of Angron's thugs. The Black Shield had Abaddon by the throat now, crushing, the rage in him all consuming. Abaddon thrust at him, but Ha simply absorbed the blows. He took six, seven. Abaddon had killed him several times over, but he refused to die. Ha's strength grew as the blood poured from him, and then it came. Ha's power fist like a siege ram at Abaddon's head, again and again and again until his Terminator helm itself was broken and deformed, Abaddon's face a twisted mess of gore. Ha was a dead weight now. He pinned Abaddon to the wall. He could not move, could not react or defend himself. But somehow his blade found the way up to Ha's throat, up and into the brain. The blade freed itself through the back of Ha's head. Yet even in death, injured Ha continued to fight Abaddon his sheer mass pinning him, trapping him. Abaddon couldn't move or see. The weight of the Black Shield slumped over, crushing him. And now, Nathaniel Garrow was standing. Raising his sword, he prepared to cut a single downward slash with Libertas, the sword whose edge cut everything. But Garrow was to be denied. He yelled and punched into the wall, for all that remained was the slumped, shifted, massive bulk of Ha's corpse. Abaddon, and faded away, returned to the teleport chamber. In some sense, Ha had achieved what many Black Shields had set out to claim, the choosing of their own death at a place and time that had significance and which was befitting of what and who they were. Ha had thrown all his wrath and fury upon the first captain, and were it not for the timely actions of those aboard the Vengeful Spirit, Nathaniel Garrow would have ended him. Yet Abaddon himself was heard to whisper upon his return, let me go back. He spoke these words upon his arrival to the ship in a disorientated and semi-conscious state, for he had prepared himself to die below the Saturnine Gate. But more than this, Abaddon and some others of the traitors who had not accepted fully the twisted path of chaos that they were set upon, he wished to die as they were, still warriors, still Astartes. Ha! had achieved this goal, despite the rest of his legion and Primarch falling into the lap of the Blood God, and who were now little more than minions, puppets of the warp, Ha and many other Black Shields like him had chosen their own destiny, something that many others would come to wish for, but for them all, it was already too late.